Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. My name is Duffy Robbins. Good to see you this morning. Those of you who are here uh, on our uh, Klein campus, Court Season West, great to have you with us. And uh, if you are joining us this morning from the Woodlands uh, campus, good to have you as well. Thanks a lot for being here. And of course, if you're joining us online, uh, always a pleasure to have you a part of our, uh, our Faith Bridge family. My, uh, my grandkids and I just dis- uh, discovered an app this summer that uh, we've been having some fun with. Um, and I'm sure you've seen these things. It's basically, uh, it's kind of a, uh, a photo morphing software. So it allows you to, you know, distort images in fun and, and creative ways. For example, we took my face um, and, and altered it so that I look a little bit like a, a mushroom. Uh, and that's kind of fun, or maybe a really festive traffic cone. Uh, or uh, we, we, uh, we discovered that uh, we could give me an alien face. That was kind of cool. Uh, and then uh, there's one little uh, adjustment you could make that uh, we made my face into the shape of a figure eight. Uh, that was uh, actually a little too close to the real thing. And then uh, we, we uh, but it's just fun. You could you could make pictures uh, of your family members or friends uh, and, and just kind of mess around. And, and, and it's just, just kind of good clean fun uh, to see these people there <laughs> as you've never seen them before. In fact, one of, my, uh, one of my favorites is one we do with my grandson, Henry, uh, where he starts off kind of looking like a cartoon figure, uh, and then he ends up looking like a claymation character. And, uh, and actually, me and uh, Henry and Sadie decided that our favorite part of this picture is the woman in the background uh, <laughs> who doesn't even know she's a part of the fun. Uh, <laughs> it's kind of fun watching her do her thing, but uh, nothing says summer fun like uh, disfiguring your loved ones. Uh, but, but I am beginning here this morning because uh, I want us to think about uh, three foolish faces that stare out at us, not, not from our iPhones, not from our iPads, but from the ancient words of collective wisdom that are given to the people of God in the book of Proverbs, in the book of Proverbs. And as much as these crazy faces kind of make us smile, I hope that this morning uh, we'll take very seriously what we observe from the book of Proverbs about what I'm going to call today three faces of folly. Three faces of folly, because these are the faces of a fool. These are the faces of a fool. If they have a Bible this morning, I'm going to invite you to open it with me to the book of Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. And if you do not have a Bible, you'd like to follow along, you see these folks uh, who are wandering the aisles, they have Bibles, they'd be happy to make one available to you if you just raise your hand and you can read along with us if you would like. Proverbs chapter 1, we're going to actually begin reading in verse 20, verse 20, where we hear the voice of wisdom crying out to us with an Uh, an urgent word of warning. Proverbs chapter one, verse 20. Out in the open, wisdom calls aloud. She raises her voice in the public square. On top of the wall, she cries out. At the city gate, she makes her speech. How long will you who are simple love your simple ways? How long will mockers delight in mockery and fools hate knowledge? Repent at my rebuke. Then I will pour out my thoughts to you. I will make known to you my teachings. And let's skip down to verse 29. But since they hated knowledge and did not choose to fear the Lord, since they would not accept my advice and spurned my rebuke, they will eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes for the waywardness of the simple will kill them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. But whoever listens to me will live in safety and be at ease without fear of harm. And let me just add uh, to this Old Testament passage uh, a short reading also from the New Testament. This is from uh, the epistle of James. I'm just going to read a few verses from his first chapter beginning in verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person 
should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. We are uh, this morning uh, on the threshold of a new school year, just a couple of weeks away. That means new adventures for those of you who are students. It means uh, adjustments for those of us uh, who are, are here as family and, and maybe even for some of us uh, who have uh, maybe taken new jobs over the course of the summer. There are adjustments and stresses to be faced there. Uh, and then if all that doesn't uh, give us a question uh, enough and confusion enough, uh, we also happen to be, uh, as you know, uh, in the throes of an election year. I don't know if you've heard about this or not. Uh, an election year, uh, a season that provides many, many uh, examples of foolishness, uh, but nonetheless, uh, a season that requires us to make some very, very important and serious decisions, a season that requires of us uh, real wisdom, which I think suggests that maybe this is a good time uh, as we move into this uh, you know, series on stubbornness from First Peter, as we move into a new season of school and family and the election, maybe this is a good time to stop and say, well, let's take a couple of weeks to reflect on wisdom, to think about foolishness and wisdom. Uh, so we're going to do kind of a two-week mini-series this week and next. I'm calling it Wise Thinking in a Foolish World. Wise Thinking in a Foolish World. Let me just say up front that it's a little bit difficult uh, to, to define the word uh, fool, especially if you don't uh, want to actually mention uh, a television talk show host by name. Uh, or, or perhaps uh, show an Instagram post of someone who has taken selfies of her backside. Uh, the, the way the Hebrews got around this uh, delicate uh, problem uh, was they actually came up, it's interesting, they came up with several different Hebrew terms to talk about foolishness. There's not just one Hebrew word, there are several words. In fact, uh, in that passive you just read, verse 22, all by itself, there are three different terms used in the Hebrew for the word fool. Uh, because as you know, the beauty of foolishness, and I think you probably noticed this uh, among your friends and uh, workmates and family members and former boyfriends and girlfriends, uh, is that foolishness is multifaceted, uh, right? We, you know, we human beings are capable of being fools in many wonderful and varied ways. Uh, it's like the old saying, uh, it's hard to make something foolproof because fools are so ingenious. Uh, what we're going to try to do this morning uh, is to think about foolishness uh, in terms of three basic faces of folly. Three basic faces of folly. Those three basic faces are these. First of all, superheroism. Superheroism. Secondly, super I knowism. Super I knowism. And then thirdly, just plain super bozoism. Uh, just kind of walk into a door stupidity. So, so uh, let's agree, by the way, <clears throat> as we go through these uh, various marks of foolishness, that you're not allowed to elbow uh, your spouse or your friend or your little brother and go, hey, Duffy's talking about you. Uh, let, let, let just allow the Holy Spirit uh, to make the convictions and the appropriate uh, applications, okay? So um, let's begin with the very first, and in some ways I think maybe the most obvious face of folly, and that's super bozoism. <clears throat> super bozoism. Uh, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 15, we read these words. The simple believe everything, but the prudent give thought to his steps. The simple believe everything, but the prudent give thought to his steps. The, uh, the Hebrew word pephi is used only once in the entire book of Proverbs, but it points, I think, to a type of foolishness that we see over and over again in, in everyday life. It refers to simple gullibility. Uh, what I'm calling this morning super bozoism. It just, it's just being naive. It's just believing everything that you here, lacking discernment. I think all of us recognize that we live in a culture where we are constantly being bombarded by, by, by proverbs of, of various kinds. That they're embodied in logos and in brand names and in, in the jingles. Uh, I, I kind of call them pop culture proverbs. These are the words that come to us uh, over and over again so much that we forget we're actually hearing ideas and not just, not just uh, phrases. Uh, and what happens is by, by just force of sheer repetition, um, without our even being aware of it sometimes, 
sometimes, these little pop culture proverbs begin to shape the way we think. They begin to actually change the way we mentally operate. We'll do a little, um, do a little experiment here. Let's see how many of these pop culture proverbs uh, you know. Uh, let's do it like this. I'm going to give you the first part of the proverb, and then you uh, exuberantly, uh, I'm saying this because I didn't use that in the first service, and I think that was the problem, uh, but uh, exuberantly, you will uh, give me the second part of the proverb, okay? So if I were to start off and I were to say to you, there are some things in life money can't buy, you would enthusiastically say, for everything else, there's what? Let's close in prayer. Uh, Yeah, no, uh, okay. You know, when I was preparing this sermon, this was working great. Then I have to actually bring in a congregation. But uh, yeah, okay, so yeah, you would say for everything else, there's MasterCard. Okay, this is going to be more difficult uh, than I thought. Let's try another one here. Think, you've seen this bumper sticker, I know. Think Globally, act locally. Okay, good. Uh, you, all right, how about this one? This, this, this is a proverb that uh, was incessant in my growing up years. You only go around once in life, so that's right. Go, and it scares me a little bit that you know it. Uh, yeah, that's uh, the gospel according to Budweiser. And let's pray for this brother. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, Grab for all the gusto you can. Okay, about this one, I know you've seen it. He who dies with the most toys. Yeah. Uh, Okay, Alan Jackson fans. Here's a country music fan. Keep him away from the coffee uh, prior to the service. Yeah, yeah, good. No, I appreciate that. We don't usually have charismatics here, but that's great. Uh, Okay, Uh, how about this one? Uh, It's five (laughs) o'clock. Yeah, that's the one we all know. Okay. Let's do close in prayer. Okay, how about this? Uh, if you're a mom or a dad, I know you've used this line before. Nothing good ever happens after midnight. Okay, do we have any boomers here? Old rock and roll fan, Stephen Stills, you may remember this one. If you can't be with the one you love, again, one you know quite well. Uh, okay, how about this? If you've ever been in any sports team whatsoever, I'm sure you've heard this uh, proverb. It's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog. And then very, very short one, very succinct. Yo. Yes. Yo. Hello. Excellent. Now, you know, most of these little phrases are are, are fairly harmless. Uh, but, But what this little experiment, I think, reminds us is that when we talk about wisdom, we're not talking in a vacuum. Right? We, we, uh, you know, yes, yeah, scripture is a profound source of wisdom. And the book of Proverbs offers us vital insights into wise living. But there are a lot of voices out there. There are a lot of Proverbs out there. Uh, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 20, we hear the voice of wisdom crying out to us in God's word. But what we need to realize is that there are a lot of other voices in the mix. And they're offering the wisdom of the world. In other words, the problem is not a lack of advice. The problem is not a lack of advice. It's an inability to sift through the advice and discern which ones we should actually believe. The simple believe everything. It's kind of like fast food. Uh, The problem is not a lack of places to eat. The problem is trying to figure out which ones are offering something that might actually be toxic. In other words, that that, that when we're trying to to listen to the voice of the culture, we need to exercise discernment. When our choices are shaped by bumper stickers and and catchy lyrics and worldly wisdom and Instagram posts, we're probably not going to live lives shaped by wisdom. That's the problem of bozoism. The simple believe everything. Wisdom calls to us in the blizzard of of, of daily proverbs to, that come to us from screens and friends and, and teachers and music and television, and magazines, and, and, and sometimes, frankly, even, even from family members, we need to pay attention. We need to exercise discernment. We need to watch closely. To use the words of Psalm chapter one, uh, we need to be aware that there are scoffers and sinners and, 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 and wicked people and that their counsel their counsel might easily mislead us if we lack discernment. The wise person pays attention 
to which Proverbs should be sought out and which voices should be shut out. The problem is that the voice, the, the kind of the default response uh, of the fool is to uh, taste first, then test, right? Consume, then consider. That's, that's bozoism. That's bozoism. Super bozoism, that's the very first face of, of folly. Let's, let's take a look at the second, second face of folly. Now, this morning we're going to call it super I knowism. Super I knowism. Nobody is as smart as moi. Nobody's as smart as me. Um, the actual Hebrew word uh, for this kind of fool is kesil. Kesil. It's a word often uh, translated in the book of Proverbs as the mocker. The mocker. Uh, in, in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 22, uh, we're, we're told that the kesil, the fool, the mocker, hates knowledge. And why does the mocker, why does the fool hate knowledge? Because the fool thinks they already know everything there is to know, right? They already know it all. Tim Keller actually calls this kind of fool the, the obstinate fool or the, or the stubborn fool. Uh, sometimes the book of Proverbs uses an even stronger term uh, for this, this kind of fool. Uh, he's referred to as a scoffer, a scoffer, which is kind of a, a, a mocker on, uh, on steroids. But what it really boils down to, we saw it in the video just, just moments ago, what it really boils down to is just plain old stubbornness. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 7 describes it this way. Whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse. In other words, you, 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 you try to maybe suggest this, but you immediately get assaulted uh, in response. He who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. This is the type of foolishness that is toxic to basically any kind of dialogue or interaction that requires us to listen and look beyond our Selves, beyond our own opinion. It seems to blossom, in particular in political seasons, when, when, when it turns honest and sincere a political disagreement into a shouting match, uh, name calling. But it's a virus that affects all kinds of communication. Uh, phrases like, uh, you know, what do you know? You're only a kid. Or, uh, 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 you know, I can't believe you're this clueless. Or, uh, oh, yeah, well, you're a liberal. Yeah, well, you're a you know, you're a Republican. Yeah, well, you're a fundamentalist. Yeah, well, you're a vegan. You know, <laughs> you're a Dallas Cowboy fan. I mean, you know, basically what happens is we sort of just throw these labels around. Suffice it to say, there is no better way to kill a marriage than to walk or talk the way of the scoffer. Because it doesn't take seriously the feelings, the thoughts, the, the genuine ideas of another person. Of the 20 plus times the Hebrew word kesil is used in the book of Proverbs, two of the most vivid examples come to us in Proverbs chapter 18. First of all, verse 2 A fool takes no pleasure in understanding. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. Verse 6, chapter 18 again A fool's lips walk into a fight, and his mouth invites a beating. A fool's lips walk into a fight, fight, fight and his mouth invites a beating. Talking without listening is the trap of a fool. And if the first mark of a fool is that they will believe anything, the second mark of a fool is that they think they know everything. So we have two faces, two faces of folly. The first, super bozoism. Uh, and then second, super I knowism. Let's talk about a third, uh, final face of folly. Uh, I'm going to call it super heroism. Super heroism. One of my favorite um, websites for for sort of exploring the ingenuity of the foolish uh, is a site called the Darwin Awards. The Darwin Awards. I don't know if you've been to this place. You've seen this site with tongue planted firmly in cheek. Uh, this site describes itself as, quote, a place to recognize those who have contributed to human evolution by selecting themselves out of the gene pool. Uh, and, 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 and some of these are actually pretty classic. Uh, for example, there's the guy that wants to get the close-up of the gator's nostrils uh, and the tonsil uh, of a large reptile. Uh, there are the girls taking a selfie on the active uh, subway track. 
Uh, and then uh, this painter who has found uh, a creative way to work without having to use something as cumbersome, cumbersome as scaffolding. Uh, or the people who are standing directly under a rock uh, they have been warmed, may actually cave in on them. Uh, and in this one, I like guys ready to have a little bit of fun after work, just jousting <laughs> on their lawnmowers, uh, which, by the way, is also a great way to do conflict resolution on a church staff. But, uh, but superheroism, <laughs> superheroism is the notion that I am invincible. Like I am, I am bulletproof. Nothing bad can happen to me. I have matters totally and fully under my control. Let's go back to the text. Verse 32, chapter one of Proverbs. For the waywardness of the simple will kill them. For the waywardness of the simple will kill them and the complacency of fools will destroy them. Over and over in Proverbs, we are warned about the arrogance of thinking that somehow we are immune from the consequences of bad choices. This is, a, this is a theme that runs throughout scripture, the law of sowing and reaping, that what you, what you, you, you know, sow, you will reap. And that this is, this is a, a law that's written in the fabric of everyday life. Somehow, the folly of superheroism is that I can beat that. I can somehow make bad choices and will not actually face bad consequences. That's the, that's the folly of superheroism. And let me just admit that I have saved superheroism for last uh, because it requires me this morning to say some things I don't want to say, some things I'd, I'd, I'd prefer not uh, to say. And, and, and what it is I don't actually want to say is this. Um, <clears throat> clearly, superheroism is um, a folly that, that impacts all of us. None of us are immune from the folly of superheroism. But what I think uh, I can say with pretty much absolute confidence is that superheroism is especially a malady, an occupational hazard of the young. Uh, that, that if you are under the age of 25, and please don't stop listening if you are, but this is the folly about which you most need to be warned. Superheroism is an occupational hazard of youth. Brain research has actually confirmed this over the last decade. We, we knew this pretty much everybody who's over the age of 25, we saw this from our own personal experience. But what we know now being confirmed is that the, the teenager's brain, that the frontal lobes of a teenager brain, which are used for decision-making and assessing uh, risk is not yet fully developed. And, and, and so what happens is, is, that, uh, is that it's not as quick to calculate, not as capable of making the sort of calculations that, that need to be made, exercising sort of a discernment in terms of assessing risk. In fact, neuroscience now tells us that that part of the brain doesn't actually fully mature until the mid-20s, which, which is one of the reasons why, for example, uh, teenagers are three times more likely to crash their cars than adults. Because they believe they are able to make bad choices, whether it's texting or whether it's driving buzzed or whether it's going fast. They can make those choices without facing consequences. That's, that's superheroism. And at the core of it is a very, very, uh, it's a very, very foolish notion. And the notion is this, that I, I assume that I'm in control of events that are out of my control that I am capable enough or savvy enough or street wise enough that, that I am in control of events that are out of my control. Um, when my daughters were in middle school, they went to Valley Forge Middle School. And for me to drive my daughters to a school uh, on the way to work on mornings, I would actually have to leave our little community called Chesterbrook. I would drive out Chesterbrook Boulevard, then I would take a left on Valley Forge Road, drive about 50 yards to another stoplight and take a left into the driveway of their middle school, Valley Forge Middle School. Uh, and, and if you were able to kind of follow that uh, diagram, you probably realize that I had to make two left turns in morning traffic, which was tedious and time consuming, especially if we are running late. And so quite often I'd find myself going, man, I wish there was a shortcut. Yeah, I, I wish there was a cut through so I don't have to go the hard way. Well, there was actually. Uh, it turns out that right off of Chesterbrook Boulevard, there was a driveway that went into a Catholic church. 
And if you drove through that driveway, through the parking lot of the Catholic Church, there was a driveway on the other side of the Catholic Church that went right into the middle school driveway. It was fantastic. It was a wonderful time saver. Unfortunately, the Roman Catholics did not like Protestants driving through that parking lot. And, and, uh, and, and so they actually erected a sign uh, that literally said, by order of Tredyffrin East Town Police Department, no through traffic. Like, I know it seems easier, but don't try that route. You, it's not good. And literally, I mean, I, I, I remember some days taking Aaron and Kay to school, and I'd look over there, we'd look over, and we'd see a car stopped in the parking lot by some unsuspecting Protestant uh, who had been nabbed by the police uh, for cutting through the church parking lot uh, and, and, and breaching this, uh, this sanction against uh, through traffic. And, um, and, and so I, I, I just, uh, I, I thought, man, that, that's rough. There were, however, occasions when I couldn't help it. We were running late. And I had to cut through the, the parking lot of the Catholic Church. And, and I knew it was risky. In fact, I even said to my girls, I said, girls, if a policeman stops us, when he comes over to the car, I want you to say, Daddy, why won't this man let us go to Mass? But I, I, I said, I, I said, I, 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 but, but here's the thing. When we made it, all right, when we cut through, when we did it and we didn't get caught, my thought was this, wow, that was, that was lucky. Or, or, you know, if you're a Christian, you're supposed to say, thank you, God. But, but I mean, I, you know, like, like I, I, the providence of God. I mean, I don't know what it was, but I knew one thing. It wasn't because I am like totally savvy about Catholic parking lots. Like I, I knew it wasn't any of my own ability that if I took that risk and actually got through without any consequence, that wasn't anything I had done. That is the difference between wisdom and superheroism, the folly of superheroism. See, one of the problems of adolescence is that when you make a decision like that and you do take the risk and you make it, there's this calculation that goes on in your head. You go, uh-huh, uh-huh. All these warnings I've heard, they're a little bit overblown. That's just adults talking. I'm a little bit better driver than a lot of people when I'm, when I'm buzzed. Or I'm a little bit uh, better at driving even though I'm going faster. I know you're not supposed to text, but, but, but that's because people are not really savvy when they text. And I can actually get away with this. Now, of course, we do, I think most of us, eventually uh, see superheroism exposed for the folly that it is, right? Because experience can be a very, very effective teacher. But along the way, Along the way, some of us pay a very high price to learn those lessons. Some of us pay a very, very high tuition, and that, I think, is the tragedy of superheroism. Even in this room this morning, this is, this is your story. There are, there are families in this room who have discovered that the cost of, of learning these lessons goes beyond uh, speeding tickets or, or, or broken bones to, to, to fractured hopes to splintered relationships because someone made a foolish calculation about choices and consequences. I can make the cut. I can ignore the sign and I won't have to pay the consequences. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 3 reads, the prudent sees danger and hides himself. The prudent sees danger and hides himself, but the simple go on and suffer for it. And when the simple suffer, so often suffering along the way with them are family members and friends and people who love them and, and people who have also been influenced by their bad choices. We know, for example, that in America alone, one out of every six people has to suffer choices someone has made about alcohol. Because one out of every six people in this country lives in a family or knows someone or lives close to someone who has a problem with alcohol. Now, that, that's the folly of superheroes. We can make these choices, but there won't actually be consequences. That's, that's the tragedy of superheroism. So we have, we have super bozoism, which basically lacks discernment and says, well, makes sense to me. Uh, and then there's super I knowism, which lacks... Uh, humility and says, nobody knows anything uh, but me. Uh, and then there's superheroism, which lacks maturity and, and somehow says, oh, 
It won't, it won't happen to me. As we um, begin to kind of wrap up our, our time in the Word, I, I want to I make this comment. As you think about these three faces of folly, um, because there are two really, really important ideas that frame these faces of folly in the book of Proverbs. They're, they're absolutely critical. Idea number one to frame these three faces of folly is this. Our default position as human beings, our default position is foolishness. It's foolishness. In other words, all of us have a natural tendency to foolishness by nature. The, the, the wisdom is a skill that it's, it's actually got to be learned. Just like none of us are born with computer skills and, and none of us steps up on a balance beam and, and does flips and none of us are born with a great jump shot and none of us are born with the ability to play the, you know, the oboe. The, the, the wisdom is a skill to be acquired, to be learned. The whole book of Proverbs is, is sort of an exhortation, an admonition to pursue wisdom, to learn Wisdom, that's what the book is about. And without proper coaching and without discipline and, and intention, computers are going to crash and, and gymnasts are going to lose their balance and jump shots are, are going to uh, you know, miss the mark and, and the oboe is just going to be like, oh, oh boy, uh, you know, it's just going to be bad. It's just going to be ugly. Proverbs 14, 12, it frankly gives us a pretty stark appraisal of the human condition. But we need to take it seriously. We read these words. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. There is a way that seems right to a person, but its end is the way of the dead. Now, that's, that's, that's sobering. That's hard to hear. But I think it also helps us to appreciate the wonder of the second big idea, the second compelling idea that I want us to frame our thoughts with this morning. If idea number one is that our default position is foolishness, idea number two, this is huge, is that God's default position is always grace. God's default position is grace. The, the, the wisdom is not just a skill to be learned. It is a gift, freely Given, And that's why I wanted us to read those words from James chapter 1, because those words in James chapter 1 are stunning. Because this is where James says, if, if any of you, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously, generously to all, without reproach. In other words, well, now you're asking. No, without reproach, God gives wisdom generously to all. So there's a, there's a whole, there's a whole uh, kind of thrust, a, a whole vibe that God wants us to understand. This, this, this default position, God's default response is, is, is grace. Wisdom's not about being smart enough. It, it's not about getting advanced degrees. It's not about, you know, reading some self-help book or, 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 you know, hearing some esoteric secret where you read a book, you know, by uh, the latest TV mystic and then you go into a closet and smoke, you know, Himalayan salt. I mean, basically, it, it, it's about recognizing God, a good and gracious, generous God wants to give us, even in our foolishness, wants to give us wisdom. And I don't know about you, but I, I find that very, very encouraging. I, I think that, that promise that in the midst of a world that offers to me worldly wisdom and folly, God offers generously to me his wisdom. I, I want us uh, to um, finish our time in the Word this morning by reading together a passage of Scripture that I think captures this, this, this wonder of God's grace, this good gift, but also the warning of folly, these three faces of, of folly. Uh, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 an amazing, amazing statement. And I'm going to actually put it on the screen because I want us to read it together out loud. Um, this will sort of, I think, be a good way for us to sort of galvanize what we've heard this morning, but it will also be a wonderful way for us to be ushered uh, to the Lord's table because this morning we're going to spend uh, some time as the family of God sharing in Holy Communion. So let's, let's read these words thoughtfully. Let's allow God to sort of use these to prepare our hearts 
in our minds for possibly repentance, but certainly gratitude as we think about folly and the gracious gift of God's wisdom. Let's read out loud together these words, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. Let's read. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boasts in the Lord. This morning, we're going to share together around the Lord's table. This is a wonderful passage to usher us into this time together. Um, let me just give you a quick word of instruction uh, here at Faith Bridge. When we uh, receive communion together, we use what's called intinction. Um, it's a very, very simple uh, idea, but maybe a word that most of us are unfamiliar with. Uh, it simply means that uh, when you come up, um, you will just take a piece of this uh, gluten-free bread and you will tear it off and you will dip it into the cup. Uh, and, and so rather than drink out of the cup, you'll just dip into the cup and then you'll eat the uh, bread that way. And, uh, and, and let me just say to you that if you are a follower of Christ, you needn't be a member of this congregation. We want to open the Lord's table as he does uh, to all of his people. So you are quite welcome to join us this morning as a part of God's family. You remember the Lord Jesus who uh, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread he took the bread and he said, this is my body, broken for you. Take and eat this in remembrance of me. And then after having given thanks for this, he took the cup. In the same way, he said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Drink of this. Drink of this in remembrance of me. When we receive this morning the bread and the cup, we do this as a way of reminding ourselves of a generous God who gives to us not just his wisdom, but gives to us his righteousness, gives to us redemption, gives to us himself, that he does this vividly through the person of his son on the cross. And so we do this as a way of remembering this. So let's pray and thank God for these elements and thank God for his goodness and his generosity. Lord, you are a good and gracious God. We are reminded in these words from James that you give to all generously. And we wonder that a righteous and holy God who is offended by our folly would, would allow us to come to him without reproach. We know it is only by the blood of Christ who opens for us a new and living way through his flesh by his death on the cross. I pray, Lord, for my brothers and sisters here in this room this morning and those who are, who are joining us online and those who are uh, on the Woodlands campus, I pray that you would meet all of us in this moment. First of all, help us to look at our own hearts and look at our own minds and look at our own lives for these faces of folly. Do we look in the mirror and do we see this distorted image of God? Do we see how, yes, I have fallen into some of these traps. Give us, Lord, your grace to begin to turn away from worldly wisdom so that we might know the wisdom of God. We might turn away from our folly and know the power of your wisdom. And Lord, thank you for this bread. Thank you for this cup. We receive this now with gratitude for all that it means. And uh, we pray this in the strong name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hi and welcome to Postscript. I'm Lou Ann Riley, Grow Group and Discipleship Director, and I'm here with Bible teacher Duffy Robbins, who just talked about wise living in a foolish world. Right. Welcome, Duffy. Right. Good to so be here. So good to have you back today. Always a pleasure. And so you talked to us about three 
follies right. that we see. Uh, yeah. We talked about the super I know it not, I knowism, super right. bozoism, and superheroism. Good for you. How about that? Excellent. <laughs> Good. Excellent. Yes, and I think that we can probably recognize a little bit of ourselves you know, in all, all of them. Either that or it's super naivism. <laughs> yeah, okay. there's a little bit of it. Yes. In all of it. Um, so one of the questions that we had came in around the superheroism. Okay. So you talk specifically about those under 25, yeah. um, and but this question came around: How does superheroism affect those that are in their older years? How do we see right, that right. apply to everyone? Um, well, you know, sort of jokingly a little bit, but I mean, all of us who are all of us who are male, I mean, we sort of live as this superhero. I mean, s studies have shown that men, when they're asked to kind of compare their self themselves to other men in various categories of competence, uh, like one study I saw was uh, relational competence, uh, managerial ability, and then the one area where you would think self-deceit would be the most difficult, namely uh, your physical fitness in almost every category, well, in every category, men rank themselves above average. And in most categories, we rank ourselves in the top 25%. So we are, as a species, uh, as a gender, we are uh, naturally just omnicompetent. Uh, and, and, and so I think um, there is sort of that, there is sort of that uh, inborn pride, at least in Western culture for men to kind of think I'm the superhero. But, but I mean, think about it. You know, people who are, people who, these, these huge, like the smartest guys in the room, in run. Uh, you think about uh, people who were just this, you know, last week, people who were arrested on Wall Street, uh, you know, the governor of Virginia and his wife a couple of years ago. I mean, it, you know, what happens is we think somehow we are smart enough to be able to, to you know, sow this not and not have us. to reap. Yeah, and it's not going to happen to us. And, um, and, and in some ways, I think the danger is when you, you know, if you haven't learned that lesson by the time you get beyond 25, then you really do start to sort of fall into this deceit mm -hmm. that I am a better driver than most people are when they're buzzed. Like I, I'm gonna warn my kids, kids, you know, I'm gonna warn, you know, my, but, 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 but I am actually better at this. And that's when, and so in a way, that deception becomes even more ingrown and even more hardened the older we get, uh, because we think hey, I can pull this off. It's, it's sort of that, uh, it's sort of that idea that, uh, you know, I've been able to work my way this far doing it this way, I'll keep doing it this way. and. And so in a way, I think it's the, the deception begins to harden and make, and make us even more of a trap the older we get. But, but yeah, so it could be financial, could be drinking, could be, you know, I mean, think about all those guys that signed up for the Ashley Madison website, that, 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 that huge thing last summer. I mean, what were they thinking, you know? Uh, what, what they were thinking is, I'll I can do this, caught. I won't get caught. Mm -hmm. And you will get caught, you know? And I mean, let, leave aside the fact that caught or not caught, that was a stupid thing to do, but but it, it's part of it's anchored in this deceit mm -hmm. that I can do this. I can watch the pornography and it's not gonna affect my my relationships. I can, you know, I can do these. And, and that is the face of a fool. That's the folly of a fool. That's good. Uh, so one other question came in. Um, how do we recognize the difference between God's wisdom and the world's wisdom when neither goes against God's law or negatively impacts people? Like if you're making a job decision. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Great. That's a, that's a huge question. In fact, that's a question that I'm going to explore a lot more you set us up so good. next week. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, so that's precisely what we're going to talk about because this week we could talk about three faces of folly. Next, we're going to talk about three marks of wisdom. Um, and, and I'm literally going to take, uh, I don't know, a good portion, of, a fourth of that talk I, I want to talk about. Okay, all right, all right, let's take all that wisdom stuff and all the fun. How do I actually put this into practice? And so we're going to address that. However, having said that, I'll say this. I think um, this question um, understands what a lot of us struggle with is that sometimes I go, well, um, I don't trust myself. I, I know that I might be. I don't want to be, uh, you know, deceived, and I know the heart is deceitful. And so, how do I know if it's God wisdom? How do I know if it's what I want to do? And we sort of, you know, we we make a couple of mistakes. One is to not stop to ask those questions. We just kind of plow right in there. And in those cases, of course, um, the heart deceives us 
into thinking we want what, uh, what maybe uh, God, our creator and author, knows is not good for us. But the other mistake is, is also bad, and that is we keep prosecuting ourselves. We go, am I really sure? Am I absolutely sure? Should I have Cheerios or Raisin Bran? I don't know. Let me pray about this. You know, and, uh, and so we get paralyzed. You know, that, that old thing, paralysis of, of analysis type thing. Here's how I would, a short answer would be this, that, that in Scripture, God gives us uh, both precepts and principles. Precepts are the thou shalt nots that are quite clear. Principles are, um, in this situation, uh, this is what you want to remember. But in this situation, you might make a different choice because of this principle. I liken it to the difference between a stop sign and a yield sign. You know, a stop sign, it's stop. I mean, there's, you, you stop. Now, granted, we might think we can run that stop sign. We might get away with it every now and then and go, aha, I'm better than the average person at spotting the policeman. You might get away, but ultimately, you know, whether you get away with it or not, you're breaking the law when you don't stop. But there are other signs that say yield, and, and, and that might require you to stop, or it might require you to speed up, or it might require you to stay a certain speed. And that's where um, you have to bathe, we have to bathe our mind, saturate our mind in God's word, but we, are, we apply the principles. And then I think when we do that, God's going, you know what? It's, it's not like a pinpoint that is my will in this matter. It's not like, do I go to Toledo or do I go to Des Moines or do I, you know, go to, you know, Cheyenne? Because I think God says, you know what? You can pursue me. What, you, what I want you to do is pursue me. And you can pursue me in, in any of those three places. Now, it was a question, of, do I go there and work, you know, for the mafia? Or do I go here and work, uh, you know, for a minute? That, that's where you go back to your precepts again. Right. right? So I, I think that's, um, that distinction is an important one. But it also just comes back to saying I got to make sure that I use the wisdom from God uh, to, you know, to, to orient myself when I make those choices. And that's why the writer of Proverbs you know, it's a learning process. It's not just, it's not just something, but it's also a gift from God that he gives to us. So, um, yeah, I think it's approaching it that way. But we are going to talk about that Good. in more concrete details next week. We're excited to have you back. I'm sorry Hear to be more there. About Thanks it. a lot. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. And join us back here for next week for Postscript. Thank you. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.